On today's episode of Food News and Shoes, Chef Jeremy and Sylvia explore the historic Henry Clay Estate at Ashland, and Chef Jeremy makes a steak with oyster sauce inspired by Henry Clay. That's today on Food News and Shoes. influenced, locally inspired. Azure Restaurant and Patio, contemporary fine dining and a relaxed atmosphere right here in Lexington. Modern award-winning dishes with a distinctive Kentucky twist from the mind of nationally recognized chef Jeremy Ashby. Voted best fine dining in Lexington. Azure is chef created, chef driven, and Kentucky proud since day one. Taste something unique at Azure Restaurant and Patio, Beaumont Center in Lexington. Timeless experience and three years of nurturing create the real magic of Kentucky's finest thoroughbreds, like Kentucky Bourbon Barrel Ale, mellowed for six weeks in seasoned oak bourbon barrels to infuse that special aroma and flavor of the bluegrass state for you to savor slowly. Kentucky Bourbon Barrel Ale, the beer of bourbon country. From concessions to festivals, bingo halls to daycare facilities, Seaworth Superstore is Kentucky's largest dealer for all your weekend kitchen or mobile kitchen supply needs. From popcorn to snow cone machines, we have the largest selection of new and used equipment with warranties to help keep your mobile food truck or weekend event going strong. That's Seaworth Superstore for Sales Road, Lexington. That's Seaworth Superstore, putting the Kentucky workforce back to work. I passed Sullivan every day on my, on my way to work and I knew uh, that they had a culinary program and after researching culinary schools, you know, I found that Sullivan had a very, uh, a very elite program, so I wanted to, to be a part of it. Well, Sullivan is, is the perfect program for somebody who's interested in, in having more control over their own um, destiny when it comes to the culinary program. You can, you can grow as much as you want to at Sullivan, you're not hindered by anything. Um, with, with the chefs there, their knowledge is great. Today's shoppers are informed. When shopping for the family meal, today's shopper chooses Critchfield Meats for fresh, all-natural quality meats guaranteed. Make the right choice and visit our family before you feed yours. Critchfield Meats, the meat specialist, family owned and operated since 1969. That's a great A choice, folks. Now, the award-winning dishes enjoyed at Azure Restaurant and Patio can be featured at your next event when you order from Azure Catering. Our services include menu planning with our amazing food, event site location, rental equipment, linens, event staffing, and seeing to every last detail of your wedding, special event, or corporate event. Visit AzureCateringKY.com or call 859-327-7125 to start customizing your menu today. Hey, Jeremy, yeah. I'm taking notes from this book about Henry Clay. Right, you know, you're yeah. a big Henry Clay buff, well, right? Yeah, you know, uh, I actually might get to interview him someday. You never know. <laughs> uh, Sylvia, he's been dead since 1852. I'm not really oh. sure you're going to be able to, to, to go to Ashland and interview Henry Clay. Well, I'm going to have to work on this. That's then, right. right. So right. tell me about Henry Clay, though. Henry well, a fascinating thing. In fact, in this book, there's a section here on he as a farmer. Mm -hmm. And apparently, little known, I mean, he's mostly known for being a senator and a big wig and the great compromiser, and right. couldn't we use that today? But he uh, also was noted for how he worked with scientific farming. He actually uh, yeah. rotated his crops, mm -hmm. so then he used natural fertilizers and all of those kinds of things. And you know what's interesting about that, Jeremy, that? is that it we're kind of coming full circle. Right. Started out with him and tradition and how important tradition was. Then we got into refrigeration and all that stuff and then people got into industrialized food. Well, and that now, kind of, what are we? Well, that kind of agriculture is extremely important and having Henry Clay be one of the innovators of that type of farming is, is, is pretty amazing, especially that long ago. You, you know, if he's saying he rotated crops, mm -hmm. uh, we've learned a lot over the past, uh, you know, 100 years right. about that because, you know, 
know, we've been planting monolithic cultures for a long time, which rob the soil. That's right. Um, and if you're rotating crops, you kind of replenish your soil and keep your, your yields up, and um, you, you're able to, to, to just fight off more stuff and you well, grow more food. Yeah, so. it said they use natural fertilizers and planted nitrogen fixing legumes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. He also grew hemp. So this, <laughs> right. This guy really had it figured out like a long time ago, huh? Yeah, yeah. I guess you made rope. I mean, then then it went away, and, and then now we're in. Well, the midst I mean, of controversy. yeah, things are coming back around, especially in this region throughout the South. Yeah. Uh, you know, hemp is going to be on the on the cornerstone too, and a big big part of our agriculture. So, you know, tobacco has left the area, and hemp is a, you know it's used for so many things, and I guess he realized the potential even long ago. Yeah, it was a good cash crop. Let me get you into this though. One of the areas sure. that he really was an innovator was with animals, and this is a way that you can marry tradition kind of coming back to buying things locally mm -hmm. but because he was scientific and a lot of times I think these days science is taking a bashing kind of undeserved and really we've come forward and you know a lot about beef and how you know that has evolved mm -hmm. and, and talk to us a bit a bit about that because there are now all kinds of ways you can choose your beef not only where it's grown but well, it's in grain and I think what's interesting about Henry Clay is he really brought over a type of beef called Hereford cattle and when you talk about um, you know wanting to select a, a specific breed for meat production it gets really interesting when you get into farming because that's what we do now we do selective breeding now it, it kind of gets dirtied those terms because a lot of people think oh well you're messing genetically with mm -hmm. the animal but you're really just just kind of breeding two animals together. It happens in nature. So, I mean, you, there's upsides and downsides to those things. But Henry Clay, I think, really concentrated on bringing that one type of cattle over here. And that technology, you know, through selective breeding, gives you great results in your meat production. You know, if you want an animal that's really, um, you know, kind of tough and can handle the temperatures of Kentucky and different regions. Hereford was great, and you kind of learn what animals thrive in different areas. And then also, their meat changes. Um, you know, nowadays we have systems for grading meat. You know, whether it's USDA Prime, which is the highest level, two percent of beef reaches that. Uh, then choice and select and standard. Then a bunch of utility cuts underneath it that aren't even used for food production. I mean, there's so much you get out of an animal, and all the prime cuts are, are great for eating. But then, you know, there's other aspects. Of, of animal production and utility meat that you know don't even get used for food. So. Yeah, so modern is good for us in, in many, many ways. The technology has really, really helped. Uh, we just have to find the right balance and That's make right. sure we're not um, you know doing things that aren't intended for our bodies to eat. So. All right. Hey, let's go to Ashland and find <laughs> out what's going on over there. What do you say? Well, I, you know, I got a bunch of things that I can you know cook right okay. now, Sylvia, so instead of go to Ashland. No, but, let's go know. to Ashland. I insist. And let me read this book real fast though before we get there, right, okay? Sure. This place makes me feel like I've stepped back in time. Well, the Ashland Estate was first built in 1809. Well, we've got an appointment with Eric Brooks, the curator of the museum, to learn all about it. Mr. Brooks, we see this incredible spread, and, you know, we back in the Henry Clay era, or, you know, what are some of his favorite foods, things to eat? That's what we're into is the whole food side. We have a number of sources for information about foods and food ways at Ashland during Henry Clay's time, uh, family sources, etc. We know from a variety of letters and, and other documents, and to some extent from archaeological evidence, that strawberries were a major commodity at Ashland, that Lucretia was known for strawberry ice cream, which basically meant crushed ice cream and strawberries but she apparently served it regularly, and we in fact have a dessert service that we think she used for that purpose. Mm -hmm. We have records of a recipe that Henry Clay's enslaved cook prepared for a pot roast, so that evidently was something that they consumed. Archaeologically, we know that they grew and consumed tomatoes and grapes. Um, we know that Henry Clay had a wine cellar, so some of those grapes were being processed into wine in addition to being eaten. Henry Clay was called the Great Compromiser. His service of nearly half a century as a representative senator and secretary of state proved invaluable in helping to hold the country together. That's right, his compromises helped to hold back the Civil War until the nation was strong enough to survive it. Even Abraham Lincoln said Clay was his beau ideal of a statesman and often quoted him in his speeches. Abraham Lincoln is kind of one of the unknown legacies of Henry Clay in many ways. Uh, Lincoln was Henry Clay's son's age. Uh, he was a young man that grew up in the era in which Clay dominated uh, American politics 
He was a Whig like Clay. He idolized Clay. He considered Clay the politician that politicians should aspire to be. Uh, and Henry Clay's influence on Lincoln helped Lincoln become the leader that he would be uh, and helped him become someone who could lead us through the ultimate test, the test that Henry Clay averted several times with compromise, but ultimately in his passing was not able to prevent altogether. We have a great artifact uh, that really connects these two together in a way that no other artifact in the world does. We have a book that uh, is a copy of the Life and Speeches of Henry Clay, Volume 1, 1842 edition, and it's inscribed to Abraham Lincoln with constant regard to friendship, H. Clay, Ashland, 11 May, 1847. Henry Clay wasn't just a skilled politician. He was also one of the most respected breeders and scientific farmers in the country. In addition to growing grain, hemp, and a variety of fruits and vegetables, he also introduced Hereford cattle to America. Uh, Henry Clay was someone who believed firmly in the idea that there was no experiment not worth trying. Uh, he was someone that was interested in all sorts of new techniques and technologies, who wanted to improve agriculture from the economic standpoint and just enjoyed the process. I mean, he was fascinated by the idea of making better breeds or creating a better product and would engage in all sorts of activities to do that. Henry Clay first acquired the land for his estate in 1804 and by 1809 had already built the first section of the estate we see today. In addition to the mansion, he built the dairy cellar, a smokehouse, and not just one, but two ice houses. Our tour of Ashland was fascinating, but I guess I'm just not going to get to meet Henry Clay after all. Well, I'm getting ready to cook something that will cheer you up, and it's a favorite of Henry Clay's. All right, Sylvia, while you're doing this, I gotta get back in the kitchen and get some ingredients together and go cook. You enjoy your yeah, book. Go on, go on, I'm, I'm having a big time. Oh man, this is just so neat. I mean, all of the things about farming and the food that they ate, and just his whole career is just an amazing thing. You know, it'd just be so awesome if I could like actually talk to Henry Clay? Wow, I mean, just the questions that I could ask and the answers I would get would be so awesome. Let me think about that a little bit. Hmm. Ooh, man, oh, gee, Henry Clay, where would I begin? What, 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 what? Jeremy? What, what's going on? We're in one of your crazy dreams again, Sylvia. You've got me back in the 1800s. With, what? I've got to make all this spread with no electricity, no KitchenAid mixer. All the ingredients are just, they're laying out on the counter. I don't know what to do. I mean, we got, we got guests coming over. Henry Clay's coming by. Well, all I ever did was read this book and wish that I could go back in time and interview Henry Clay. Do you think it's possible, Jeremy? You know, we're, we're in the right time in the right place. So while you were sleeping, I was slaving away making this big southern bounty, and it's a good thing there was a good harvest, too, because oh, oh, oh we've got guests for dinner. It's Hello, Senator welcome, Clay. welcome, Henry Clay. Uh, uh, gosh, I don't know what to say. I'm welcome. speechless. Spectacular and I <laughs> <laughs> we didn't mean to intrude, but I am like, in a dream. <laughs> this is a well, dream. We'll doctor. share that dream then. I love that. I love that. Let's let's begin though. I, Jeremy, I've got so many questions well, I, I want to ask, did. but I want to ask this first. It's your dream, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you. Um, but this, you did this bounty. I mean, look at this food, and we want to talk to you about that. But first of all, yes. I know that you came to Kentucky from Virginia. Uh, well, we're glad you got that spirit and that you you moved in the right direction. But why? Why'd you come to Kentucky? Well. My mother and my stepfather heard about the great opportunities in Kentucky, and so they decided to remove to Kentucky. I was about 14, and they decided that I should stay and get my education in Virginia and study law. Uh -huh. And so after I became a lawyer, um, listening to all the great stories about Kentucky, well, it just seemed like a great opportunity. And so I decided to move to Kentucky. Well. Been here ever since. To well, our benefit. Tell us about this beautiful Ashland estate, you know, maybe how big it is. I heard oh, you like you. farming, and what kind of things would you grow? Oh, yes. Well, when I first came to this area, the bluegrass in Lexington, I, uh, I found this tract of land, and it started out, I think, with just about 125 acres. And as I started my law practice, and it became more and more successful, sometimes I would be uh, paid in land. 
And so I would sometimes trade land or sell land in order to grow my, my farm here. So we have over 600 acres at this point. Mm -hmm. But I do love farming. Well, I, I, know, love farming. I know that you love farming, and that's kind of what Kentuckians are all about, too. A love yes. of the land. They say there isn't a Kentuckian you can't find somewhere who doesn't want to come home. And so that's exciting. But you also yes. have an interest in cattle, which is kind of interesting to me because I know hog, you know, bacon and all that good stuff <laughs> is real popular here, but you also took a great interest in cattle. Tell us about well, all I did. That. I had the opportunity to, of course, uh, uh, travel. And while in England, I uh, was introduced to both the, the Herefords and the Shorthorn Durham cattle. Mm, and with a, uh, a friend, a neighbor, Mr. Sanders, and I decided to import the Herefords. Uh, but I do think that the uh, the Durhams, I think the Shorthorn uh, cattle are going to probably be more suited to Kentucky. And they seem to be doing very well. And they do. And you know, we've got all this great beef now. And you guys had an active lifestyle, you and Lucretia. So you had parties. Tell us about this. Oh, we did. We, uh, we were, have always enjoyed having friends and, and neighbors stop by. And of course, uh, <laughs> we've had a, a, a few, uh, few friends, like um, Webster's been here, and uh, well, a, a few more than a few politicians have stopped by occasionally. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> and that is great. Uh, there's one thing that I must ask you, absolutely must. Uh, it's about bourbon. Now, you're a great compromiser. That's what you're known as. Yes. You know? and, yes. and you talk about, you know, there's this hint and rumor that when you'd go to Washington to engage in one of those great compromises, you'd take all the <laughs> bourbon uh, the well, way that goes a long way. I, I, I think you might be able to say that bourbon sometimes helps to uh, lubricate the, the wheels of government <laughs> and it is true that uh, I had the opportunity to introduce my recipe for the mint julep to Washington society where I understand it's been very successful. Oh yes, at the Willard Hotel I yes. understand. Oh my yes. goodness, we'll have to try one right there, won't we, Gary? Right. Make a special that. field trip. <laughs> so as a visionary in the future, you, you know, there's talks of maybe these large general stores where you can buy almost anything, right? And uh, you know, is, is that something um, that we see as a positive or negative? Are we getting back to the old days or where we grow our own food and, and work with our own food? I, I, I cannot imagine such a thing, but but I'm, my friends say that I'm, I'm always optimistic about the future. And so if during the twists and turns uh, of the future, something like that should occur, I, well, I, I can't help but think that the future of this country and Kentucky will always be bright. Oh, that's great. We've so enjoyed being with you. Gosh, Jeremy, maybe this is the beginning of a lot of dreams and we can come back here again, can we? Anytime. And, and share in this? <laughs> Thank you very much for visiting. Only after a hard Thank day's work. So Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sylvia. Sylvia. Thank you for being Sylvia. Hey, Sylvia. 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 Oh, what? Sylvia. What? Hey. Jeremy. Food's all loaded up and ready to go. We gotta get this party done. Jeremy, I just had the most extraordinary dream. What was it? Wait till you hear all about it. Well, come on, we gotta get this done. All right, let's go. Hey, Jeremy, I'm reading this book about mm -hmm. Henry Clay. And you know, he was known for uh, being a, what's called a scientific farmer. First of, one of the first of their time, right? Yeah, and he was really into crop rotation, all that kind of stuff. But one of the more interesting things, and in something we're going to cover here today, mm -hmm. is his work in beef right? And, and, and all of that sort of thing. And I've got a little recipe here, and I want you to follow <laughs> my instructions. I'm like, just joking. I don't <laughs> Turn it over to Chef. <laughs> so we're going to do something that Henry Clay related today and make something with top sirloin. Mm -hmm. And I heard he liked an oyster souffle, too. Mm, good so we're going to do some nice creamy oysters on top of it with bourbon, another bourbon. thing there that Henry Clay was known to partake <laughs> know, of, to right? Like. So and sneak off with, uh, to Washington. Right. First of all, we'll get our uh, pan hot. Um, I think the most important thing about um, you know beef and searing and cooking with meat is, is proper seasoning. A lot of people just really hold back. Um, on, on seasoning and it just makes the, the outcome so much better. So I've got a nice coarse salt here mm -hmm. and pepper. Uh, pan's okay. good and hot. We'll start with a little olive oil, uh, good maybe a tablespoon. You don't, it doesn't take much. You get a little brown going ah, on. Ah, sizzle. Right, that's the, the sound you're looking for. Um, so Ooh, I'm gonna good. move this to the back burner and just kind of let it do its thing. Okay. So this pan is heating up, and what I want to do is, instead of searing, we're going to sweat some ingredients and really extract some flavors. I'm going to start with a little bit of oil, another tablespoon or so. Did you say sweat? Sweat. Hmm. And a um, nice pat of butter. I'm going to 
it's a little bit hard, we'll put that in there too. Now I love the way that when you use olive oil and butter, you get the earthiness, the tones of olive oil, and then the creaminess. The best of, of both butter. worlds. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start with the aromatics. This is a nice shallot. If you want to use onion, that's fine. But something in that family. That um, smells good, huh? Exactly. That's, that's what you mean. Oh, yeah. Man. The, the aromatic, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what I mean. Onion and garlic, mm -hmm. they both perfume and it sets this tone in the pan. No, all that's that oil. Garlic, right? That's garlic. And all that oil is going to be, so mm -hmm. you know, infused with all that good garlic and onion mm. flavor. That's an intoxicating smell that you get when you walk. This is this smell right here is what makes me want to cook. This is what gets me started and keeps me coming back every ah, time. I the love smell that of smell. onion and garlic. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn down the heat a little bit. I had it on high, but just to a nice medium yeah, low. And they're like simmering in there. Yeah, I'm really not going to rush this. You know, this gets to go for a, a good two minutes while our uh, meat is is browning on one side. <clears throat> now I'm going to flip it over. Mm -hmm. And when you're flipping, please flip away from you. Yeah, that way because, the, the, uh -huh. the oil doesn't splatter. We'll turn that over. Oh, those look delicious. Oh, yeah. Great, just a little back and forth, and those things are going to be done. Now, the oil is starting to, I mean, the garlic is starting to brown just a touch. Um, so I'm going to add some more ingredients to cause the sweating. Now, this is? This is celery. I'd say a good I quarter cup of that. A good uh, quarter Carrots? cup of carrot, yeah. Now, more good stuff. All right. This is called fennel. And I love the way it's fennel like works with mm -hmm. oysters and mm -hmm. bourbon. It, mm -hmm. it gives it the stew-like quality and this almost licorice flavor. It's highly underused, um, but this is a great application. Cream and fennel and uh, oysters, this is one of my favorite things. It's almost like a little oyster stew. And I'm going to push my ingredients to the side of the one side of the paint. Mm -hmm. What that does is allow this part to get a little bit hotter to kind of roast these mushrooms alone over here. While that stuff continues to sweat, see the, the steam mm -hmm. coming up? It's not getting as hot as it is over here. So this is an oyster mushroom. You use a good half a cup of those. Now the only difference, like in Henry Clay's time, mm -hmm. that, you know, he wouldn't have been able to get things in the dead of winter, and he had to use what he had. Right. And mushrooms are grow in Kentucky, and like, I guess all the time, right? Well, you can get them right into the dead of winter. Mm -hmm. uh, Different kinds. And, you know, who knows what they foraged mm -hmm. and uh, knew to do. A little bit of butter in there with the mushrooms. This part over here is going nicely. You know, she had, uh, Lucretia had a dairy farm mm -hmm. and uh, made a whopping $1,500 a year, and that was a lot of money back there. That uh, is a lot of money. Selling at the Lexington markets. So this little steak right here is kind of how I like it—a good how medium rare. How did you rare. know that? You poked at it. Years of experience, but you know they very have, gently you poke. Exactly. There's several little ways to do that. This one I'm going to cook a little longer, okay. and we're going to finish this up a very special way with nice fresh herbs. Back into this pan, though, the mushrooms have sweated just a little bit. I'm going to reintroduce all the other ingredients. It's really smelling good, huh? <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. now a little pat of butter because we're gonna do a little thing called a, a pan roux, like a little sangé of flour to thicken up the sauce. I know what this is. Yeah, the flour, right? Yeah. So, so we want you to take your, 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 your fingers like this and just sprinkle a little bit right in here. How'd I do? You did good. We just wanna do about two times more. Oh. And see how this butter is getting foamy? Mm -hmm. Kind of creating a nice little roux. Good. It doesn't take much. It really thickens up well. Sort of a gravy-like thing, huh? Mm -hmm. I'm going to let this cook on low over here just for about one minute. Oh, and I'm going to take this other so steak out. Good. And let it rest for a moment. Now, by the uh, way you've done that, do you know what they look like inside? Are they like medium? They're medium, medium rare. Which is the perfect way? It's the way I like it. To have beef? Um, bourbon. Gonna stick well, I'm going to have a sip of that. A good half, half, about half of it's <laughs> going to go right in there. And see how that sauce starts to thicken up? Mm-hmm. Okay. So All right, now what do we do? So see how this bourbon's kind of mm -hmm. thickening there? I'm going to add some nice heavy cream and add a little bit at a time. And stir in the ingredients. 
Now, Jeremy, one of the things that people talk about is healthy eating. Right. And these are like rich ingredients, but you know, I think enjoyable eating is pretty important too. <laughs> and I bet Henry Clay believed that too. You know, I little bourbon, little cream, never hurt anybody. As long as you eat in moderation, you know. It doesn't take much of this. A little extra cream. We're trying to get the right consistency. Sure. See, it's a little bit thick. Um, and that's on purpose because the next ingredient, one of Henry Clay's obvious favorites here, and I'm sure a real treat in this region because you just didn't get them very often, is a nice oyster. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to add a few of these fresh oysters in there and a little bit of their juice, the liqueur. Mm. Now it's going to smell real good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let those simmer down. And I like a good medium rare to medium oyster. If you want to cook them longer in the pan, uh -huh. just fine, no problem. Finish up a little extra seasoning, salt and pepper. So I'm going to give this a little bit of a test. I think. Not bad at all. The oyster liqueur really adds a lot. And one thing I think people do is, you know how I put in half the bourbon? Uh -huh. I want to finish with the other half, right at the very end. Uh -huh. That way we've got that raw bourbon flavor. A lot of recipes tend to cook out the bourbon and doesn't leave much of that kind of bite that I like, kind of, you know, mm -hmm. the one that gets you in the back of the throat. That's what's really neat about bourbon. Oh, that is a pretty sauce. So our stew is ready to go. All right. Now, now we're going to talk about finishing the steaks. Um, in the back pan, I'm going to lightly heat up all that, those good bits with some more yeah, butter. The, the beefy bits. Mm -hmm. Now, notice when the butter hits the pan. Uh huh. You Sizzle. can kind of see some of these good bits scraping up, right? And we're going to just kind of throw the meat back in there with a little fresh thyme on top. And roll your pan back and just kind of do a little basting yeah. of the fresh herb <laughs> right on top. So that oil from the thyme is dripping down. Uh -huh. Do this for a good couple minutes and the fresh herb flavor really roll right into your meat. So, okay. Now what? Now the meat what? is finishing the pan. Mm -hmm. You get the good oils from the thyme dripping down on them. Yeah, yeah. Kind of and that's all that's meant to be, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. You know, so we just kind of off. threw that in there and let the, the oil mm -hmm. seep in, give it a nice little scent, that perfume of fresh thyme. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the steak is pretty much done. We'll go ahead and put that down. And, you know, if you want to layer a whole platter out, that's fine. If you want to slice it, it's good. But we'll just kind of make this look pretty for, for our purposes, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna cut it pretty soon. I like to dive right into those big oysters and make sure you get, you know, a good one on each piece of meat. Mm -hmm. And then we'll really just sauce it up with all those other good ingredients. Is there any trick to finding oysters in uh, grocery stores? I mean, they're just everywhere, right? And they come from everywhere. <laughs> well, <laughs> do you prefer New Orleans or? Chesapeake Bay? I love or? <laughs> all oysters. Just to kind of make this one over the top, mm -hmm. with, you know, if you want to do this at home, a little pinch of this fresh crab meat would be great. And then, you know the fennel we put in there? I like to garnish with just a few of the little fronds. Um, and so just a great presentation. It really does. It is beautiful. You know, the garnishes should make sense with the dish. There should be some congruence with what's in the dish on top of the plate. So. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I gotta get some of that sauce here. Yes, you do. I can get it just right. Okay. Mmm. Not bad? Not bad, Chef. You're good. All right. Let's see how we did here. A little, I'm gonna go for the oyster combination with the beef. A little, little Chef Surf and Drift. I love like that nice mid-rare, too. Mm. And I like the frond. Mm. Well, we've really enjoyed being with Henry Clay, and this has been great, and thank you, Chef, for this. Well, thanks for letting me cook for you. I enjoy the recipe. If you guys want to learn to make this, check out www.foodnewsandchews.com, and we'll see you next time. Food News and Chews is brought to you by these proud sponsors. Alltech. Helping farmers feed the world. Azure Restaurant and Patio. Worldly influenced, locally inspired. Sullivan University. Offering higher education for people with higher goals. Azure Catering. Catering the most important events. Yours. Critchfield Meats. Fresh, high quality, all natural meats. Guaranteed. And 
Seaworth Superstore, fulfilling all your kitchen supply needs. If you would like a DVD copy of this episode of Food News and Chews, visit foodnewsandchews.com or email us at info at foodnewsandchews.com.